Hi, welcome to the next episode of The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. And I'm Brittany. Um, this week, Brittany, we're going to start with our pet news. we got mm-hmm. some really a couple of interesting stories here. So I saw this one and I thought, this is really interesting. These researchers come up with the most crazy things to try and test. Uh-uh. So the question they're trying to answer in this study is, do dogs get jealous? Yes. <laughs> So, I mean, people believe that they get jealous. They, they, we tend to anthropomorphize the pets and give them our, our human characteristics and emotions. But they wanted to actually see if that was something they could measure. Okay. So they did a study out of the University of California in San Diego, and they actually did come up with some proof that dogs are jealous. Okay. So they used 36 dogs and their owners, and they had the dog guardians do three things. Um, one was to demonstrate acts of affection to a fake animatronic dog. It's a little <laughs> robot dog. Okay. They were going to demonstrate affection to a plastic jack-o'-lantern, Halloween okay. pail. Halloween okay. pail. <laughs> and then they're going to read a children's book aloud, ignoring their dog. Okay. <laughs> so those are, I mean, those are things that, you know, you're giving attention to something else to see if the dog's interested in it. So what they found is 80% of the dogs physically pushed their guardians when they were demonstrating affection to the robot dog. Oh, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> they just pushed them away. <laughs> Only about 40% of the dogs did this when they uh, faked affection to the Halloween pail. Okay. So they're more threatened by something that looked like a dog than and just something a pail. else. Okay. Which is kind of interesting. And 20% of the dogs want attention when their owners read aloud while ignoring them. Okay. Okay. Now, in addition, 25% of the dogs were actually aggressive towards the fake competing pup, barking at it and even trying to bite it. I can see that one, yes. <laughs> I just can't see that. I can see that. And one real needy dog acted aggressively towards the plastic pail. <laughs> I think he also was acting aggressively to the book, so he was just eh, He's really got some anxiety needy. issues yeah. there. So while, while they're smart enough to try and break up connections with their owners um, and a seeming rival, dogs may be motivated to protect an important social relationship with their owners. So that's they're basically trying, this is uh, an evolutionary thing, they're trying to bring this back to where this behavior might have developed. Mm-hmm. And they think it might have evolved from dogs having to compete with their siblings for pater- with, uh, paternal resources. Okay. So food nursing, things like that. As we domesticated dogs over time, the two-legged humans became began to fill in this parental role yeah. so that they needed to compete against other things that they perceive as competition. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean for uh, people and their dogs? It's important that you don't tolerate and don't positively reward inappropriate behavior. Yeah. Attention-seeking behavior can lead to jealousy-like behavior that includes aggression in some cases, like mm-hmm. that one dog that tried to eat the robot. Well, and a lot of things, too, like it is um, paternal, but a lot of things is a dog see you as the alpha as well. Yeah. So a lot of times you have to play that alpha role. Like, okay, you can be a little jealous, but you have to know when to shut it down sometimes. Yeah. Well, they suggest they have a couple tips hints here. Uh, when you see inappropriate jealous behavior, give a simple no command. Mm-hmm. Make sure you don't give inappropriate rewards if your dog is acting inappropriately. So don't yeah. reach over to cuddle, baby talk, or reward them with a treat when they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to say, a comfort them. Because basically they're cons- uh, consider that a reward. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, try and show equal affection and time to both two-legged and four-legged family members. And we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Especially yeah. when introducing newborn babies to the family pets. Mm-hmm. And the sooner you identify a problem, the easier it's going to be to treat. Yeah. So, again, another thing that seems obvious, but they were actually to, able to have people do this in front of their dogs i just think it's <laughs> crazy that 80 percent of them would really push away that other robot dog i mean i'm not surprised you do see a lot of videos of like animals pushing away a computer or something because the owners are working on, yeah. yeah something <laughs> so at least that one was actual dog look alike okay um so my fun one uh, we're actually doing pretty much like a continuation from the super bowl one okay um i know last time we talked about it you guys heard that the weather tech ceo donated or did almost, what was it, like $6 million, $6 million for, for ad. ad on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, well, Petco decided to donate $250,000 to the University of Wisconsin um, Veterinarian School. Um, by now, you probably heard about Scout. You know, he was that dog in the ad, you know, because he survived uh, from his grave prognosis from cancer. Um, but thanks to the efforts of the University of Wisconsin, Scout's doing great right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the CEO from Petco actually reached out to um, the CEO from WeatherTech 
And he decided to donate through Facebook, and they did the public announcement there, that they were donating $250,000 to the school for a wellment and, um, you know, to help get supplies and everything up. Um, And then the reason they did this, uh, the CEO actually wrote a comment stating that together with our longtime partners in fighting pet cancer at Blue Buffalo, we are humbled and proud to answer your call to action. With this uh, what inspires me the most about your story is the un- unapolog- unapologetic way you are using your position and platform to raise awareness for something that affects so many people and those of us who love them endlessly. Yeah. That was I thought that was a really nice comment. And then the fun thing is that um, that CEO, Ron, his dog, Yummy, which is adorable 11-year-old <laughs> yellow lab, which and I think I love the name, he, she actually survived cancer as well. Um, and he just wanted to set, give his thanks to the remarkable vets, vets there as well. Um, and he's hoping that by joining forces, you know, we can help save more animals like Scout and Yummy. And he said that they're both doing great, living their lives. Yeah. And, you know, Yummy, I actually looked her up on her uh, Twitter account. She is adorable. If you guys want to look for her, <laughs> she's Yummy at Petco. Adorable. <laughs> 11-year-old lab. Well, it just shows how much that ad reached people, mm-hmm. and there are probably uh, many, many more people who have reached out for donations that, yes. that aren't uh, getting the attention to this. So thank you to everyone who's uh, responded to that call for action. All right, this, uh, today's health topic, we're going to talk about glaucoma, mm-hmm. uh, and this affects both cats and dogs as well as people, yes. so people know about it because when you go into the doctor, you get that little air puff test when you have your eye mm-hmm. exam. So glaucoma is basically an increase in the pressure inside the eyeball. Okay. So in the eyeball, there's an a, um, area called the ciliary body, and the epithelium around there produces fluid. It's called aqueous humor. Okay. That goes from the back of the eye through the iris to the front of the eye, hmm. and then it drains out between the cornea and the iris. Hmm. And so there's a circulation of fluid. So anything that causes... Um, that fluid not to drain properly will increase the pressure in the eye because the ciliary body is going to keep producing that fluid. Its uh, prevalence is about 1% in dogs, about 5% in some other breeds, and about 1 in 500 cats are affected by it um, in general. Okay. There's two forms, a primary, which is generally a hereditary. Uh, We see it more in purebred dogs. It's very rare in cats. In the dogs, you're going to be really looking at the Basset Hound, the Shiba Inu, the Shih Tzu, Beagle, Norwegian Elkhound, Cairn Terrier. Okay. In cats, Siamese and Burmese cats are more prone to this. Hmm. Uh, anatomic malformations at the drainage angle is what typically causes this. It's called uh, goniodysgenesis. Whoa. So I'm going to throw out a lot of big words here, <laughs> here but basically what it means is um, the normal little, it's like a little mesh of tissue that gets kind of much less um, open. Okay. So the fluid doesn't have as much space to drain right through, through, so it can't drain as quickly. You can also get these uh, drainage angles being blocked by a buildup of proteins in the eye, too. And, uh, the primary uh, culprit for that is glycosaminoglycans, and they can in- increase the resistance to the flow and cause the pressure to go up as well. Hmm. Um, uh, primary glaucoma is typically bilateral. It's going to affect both eyes, but usually one eye will start to show symptoms before the other. Okay. So if we see it develop in one eye, we're going to watch the other eye because it's probably going to develop in there as well. Secondary uh, glaucoma occurs when there's uh, other problems going on in the eye. Typically, uh, we see a lot with uh, lens luxation. So the lens sits right behind the um, iris, mm-hmm. which is where the pupil is. And if that lens gets loose from this little holder, it'll f- block up into the pupil and block the flow of the fluid from the back of the eye to the front of the eye. Hmm. So that's called anterior lens luxation. Inflammation inside the eye, which we call uveitis. Hyphema, which is a buildup of blood in the eye, and that can occur from trauma. Okay. Uh, it can occur because of uveitis as well. Um, there's also a, uh, a glob of jelly in the back of the eye called the vitreous body. Okay. And that can sometimes... Um, Leak, leak into the front part of the eye and block the, the flow of the uh, fluid Absolutely. as well. Huh. Very interesting. There can also be adherence of the iris to the lens. So the lens doesn't necessarily move, but the iris itself gets stuck to the capsule of the lens. Huh. And then that will block the flow through the, the pupil. Um, we'll also see it in tumors of the iris. And we're going to talk about that with our case of the week. Um, intraocular surgery can end up causing this because it can cause... Uh, 
proteins and stuff to build up in the angle from the, the trauma mm-hmm. of the surgery. Um, and then uh, trauma. So getting a, a, a poke in the eye, getting a puncture in the eye can lead mm-hmm. to these things that can go forward. Um, secondary is usually going to be uh, single eye affected. But there are some generalized diseases that can cause increased pressure in the eye. In that case, it's going to affect both eyes. Yeah. In cats, the most uh, common cause for the um, secondary is a lymphocytic plasmacytic uveitis. So mm-hmm. that's just a type of inflammation involving a lot of lymphocytes and plasmacytes from the blood. Uh, they also get a diffuse melanosis or melanomic conditions. Melanoma is uh, the cancer in the iris. So when the iris swells, it's going to close off that angle between itself and the cornea and not allow that fluid to come through. Mm. And then the cat's penetrating injuries in the eye, usually from the claw of another cat, (laughs) are a very common situation that will result in the secondary glaucoma. When we do our diagnosis, we're going to look at some physical findings. And here's some other great words here. Blepharospasm. Okay. Okay, That's just (laughs) uncontrolled blinking or twitching of the eyelids. Okay. Conjunctival hyperemia, so that's just the white part of the eye is looking very red. Okay. Episcleral injection. That sounds cool, <laughs> isn't it? That's when the vessels on the sclera, the white part of the eye, get really distended, and they actually look like they're standing up from the, oh, the wow. eye. They're really kind of creepy looking. Um, corneal edema. And corneal edema, the cornea is the front part of the eye, the clear part of the eye. That's just where edema gets cloudy. Okay. So when we see uh, increased pressure, it can actually change the shape and press on the cornea and cause that cloudiness. Midriasis, that's a great term. That just means that the pupil is dilated. Oh. So the pupil is bigger than it normally is. I thought is. it was going to be dry. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite is meiosis, <laughs> whereas the pupil gets very small. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're also going to see decreased vision, especially mm-hmm. once the pressure starts getting pretty high. It can start to damage the eye. Um, when we're looking in the eye with the ophthalmoscope, we can sometimes see this optic nerve and retinal edema, so okay. swelling of the of an optic nerve. We can also see... Um, luxations of the lenses with the ophthalmoscope so you can see that popping through hmm. cataracts and that can happen before or after the lens luxates um, bupa ophthalmus is another cool word it just means enlargement of the eye okay so bupa ophthalmus <laughs> that's pretty cool then uh, we'll also see uh, retinal degeneration and atrophy as the disease progresses longer so instead of the retina just being edematous we'll actually see the loss of the blood supply and the degeneration <laughs> of the the nerves in the mm. retina. We're going to also, when we're diagnosing, we're going to do tonometry, which is how we measure the pressure in the eye. I mentioned in people, they use a the little puff of air that can measure how the eye distorts. Mm-hmm. In the animals, we have a little tonometer that has a little plastic ball on a little metal rod yes. that bounces off the eyeball. Mm-hmm. And you think the animals <laughs> would hate this, but they sit there and you just press the button and it just bounces mm-hmm. off your eye a few times and gives us a measurement. Normal in dogs is about 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury in the eye, although up to 24 is not too bad. Cats, 10 to 25 is pretty typical. If you have like a a dog or cat that's like at 25 and you're not sure and you check the other eye and it's like 15, then probably that's significant. So if you've got differences greater than about 7 millimeters of mercury, they consider that to be pretty significant if it varies. And another thing is that intraocular pressure can vary during different times of the day. So they say when it's kind of at that borderline, it's important to recheck them at another time before you make your diagnosis because Mm. if you check another time and it's normal, that's the reading you should go with. If they have glaucoma, it's going to be consistently high and it's not going to go down. Is there a reason it's different for days? Like you wake up and your eyes are a little Uh, more pressurized? If you're more dehydrated, it can can affect the pressure in your eyes. In fact, that's one of the ways we treat it is we try and dehydrate the animals. There's this really cool tool. Um, it's a special contact lens you can put on the eye, and this is um, gonioscopy, where you can actually see uh, between the iris and the cornea. Hmm. So it, it bends the light, so you can normally you can't see that with your regular ophthalmoscope. With this gonioscopy, a gonioscope lens, it lets you see that pretty well, and you can uh, identify these primary changes: the the decrease in the mesh there. Uh, or you can see clogging of, of that there with little fibrin particles or these other protein particles. Mm. Um, there are genetic tests that you can do for the dogs that have genetic conditions. There's actually some commercial tests. There's one that's available for the beagles, the Petite Bassett Griffin Vendines, yes. <laughs> which is a cool name, uh, and the Sharpays. Okay. Uh, there's another uh, different uh, gene for the Sharpays that ha- they have a test for. Okay. Um, if the glaucoma is secondary, like we before, did before, you may need to do some just generalized testing, look for systemic illnesses, so blood tests and a a thorough medical workup. So treatment, 
again, just like with a lot of conditions, you're going to have emergency treatments and then just the chronic management for mm-hmm. this. So if we have an animal that comes in and their pressure is greater than 50. Um, we're going to try and get that pressure down as quickly as possible mm-hmm. to try and save their vision, especially if they're the owners have said they just seem to have lost their vision. We're going to use prostaglandin analogs. Latanoprost is the most common one that we use, and that's actually designed to reduce the fluid production by the ciliary body. So we're going to put this in the eye every 10 to 15 minutes for about three doses and see if we can get that pressure to come down within about 45 minutes. Okay. If it's not coming down within about 45 minutes, we're going to give them uh, a systemic uh, hyperosmotic medication. So this mm. is something like mannitol or glycerin, which we inject, and it actually then dehydrates the animal because it's making the blood more dense, and it helps pull fluid out of the yeah. eye a huh. little bit quicker. And you may need to do a couple doses of that in order to get the pressure down as well. Uh, some of the risks with that, you can't give those type of medications if they have concurrent heart failure, yeah. renal insufficiency, or if they're already and dehydrated. dehydrated. If you're going to do that, you're going to make things a lot worse. Once we get that pressure down, or if they come in and the pressure is not quite 50, but it's maybe in the 30s and we want to get it down, then we're going to do the maintenance medications. So dorsolamide, which is a carbonic anhydrous inhibitor, is one of the most typical ones that we'll use. We do that about every eight hours. We might add that in with a beta adrenergic blocker. So the most common one is timolol. Yes. And there's actually a medication that combines the dorsolamide and timolol that they have for people. So oh, that cool. saves having to, to do multiple treatments. And uh, we have to be careful with these beta blocker ones because even though we're giving it topically, it can have systemic effects. So we can dogs that have chronic airway disease, it can actually constrict their airways, mm. and it can lower the heart rates. Um, we talked about the prostag- prostaglandin analogs with the emergency treatment. That's latanoprost. There's a, a bimatoprost, travoprost, tafloprost. They all got the prost in them, <laughs> the so the prostaglandin. So that's how you can tell what they do. They're typically once a day medications. Um, they can induce the uh, meiosis, which is the constricting of the pupil. And if you're giving it twice a day, there's been cases where the pupil gets so tiny it can actually affect their vision. Oh. So they won't be able to see, not because their retina is bad, but because there's not enough lights getting into their eye. Huh. And if they already have a lens luxation or inflammation in the eye, we're not going to use those medications until yeah. that's taken care of. Um, in the past, we used medications called pilocarpine and demacarium bromide. They've largely been replaced by the prostaglandin analog. So those were some oral medications. Some of the uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can be given orally too, but the problem is they tend to have very bad side effects when giving orally. Mm. And since there's a lot of good topical things, we don't typically do that very much. There are some surgical procedures that can be done to treat this chronically as well. And the most common one is cyclophotocoagulation. Fun word. Sounds really good. (laughs) They're shooting a laser in the eye, and what they're trying to do is kill off some of the ciliary body cells that are producing the fluid. Oh, okay. So if they produce less fluid, the eye can drain a certain amount without having problems, and they can decrease the pressure without affecting the health of the eye. Okay. Um, Used to do it with cryotherapy where they'd go and, like, do little freezings around the eye, but this is much more safer Mm -hmm. and much more effective. The... Uh, the thing that they'll do is what's called an anterior chamber shunt. Okay. And basically, it's a little tiny uh, tube that gets in, placed inside the eye and then and sewed underneath the sclera on the outside of the eye. And it gives another pathway for the fluid to go. So the fluid does not have to go through that angle between the cornea and the iris. Mm-hmm. It goes through this tube out into the sclera and it gets absorbed in the tissues that way. Oh. So it's a, a permanent fix. You can have some complications with that surgery, infections yeah. and stuff, but um, when they do that, that's a, a really good way of uh, dealing with it chronically. And then you may not have to give medication at yeah. all. Oh, wow. If they have a luxated lens, we're typically going to recommend having that removed. Okay. In some cases, they might put a replacement in, but not always. Cool. If the eye is already blind, then really there's not much we're going to do to restore that vision. Mm-hmm. It's gone. So if it's gone that far or if it's uh, very acute or it's just very high and it's just nerve damage, um, there's several procedures that we're going to do. And removing the eye is one of the more common, least expensive ways of dealing with that. Excuse me. (laughs) Removing the eye is one of the least expensive and common ways of dealing with that. Okay. It uh, relieves the pain immediately for the animal. It gets rid of the problem. And if it's just one eye, the animals do very well, Mm -hmm. especially if it's trauma-related and you've got an infection in there or if you've got a tumor, Mm -hmm. that may be your best way of dealing with it. Uh, We're also going to consider evisceration. And this is where instead of removing the eye, you take the insides of the eye out and you put a little tiny prosthesis inside the globe of the eye. So they still have an eye, 
there, so it looks like an eye, but it's it's not going to look like a normal eye because the prosthesis Process. does not have the iris and all that stuff in there. Huh. But it gives them a normal shape, and their face is going to look normal. And so that, that can be helpful for people who don't want their animals to look like they're missing an eye. Aww. The other thing that uh, I've done a couple times is called an intravitreal injection. Oh. And we'll use either genomycin, which is an antibiotic, or sidfovir, which is an antiviral that's used for treating AIDS patients. Um, and you actually sedate the animal. You suck out a little bit of fluid from their eye, and then you inject a little bit of this antibiotic in there. Typically, uh-huh. I'll add a little uh, anti-inflammatory, some steroid in there, too. And this antibiotic and this other antiviral drug will actually kill the ciliary body. Oh. So then the eye stops producing the fluid, and the pain's gone. They're, they're already not seeing, so right. it doesn't matter if they can't see. One of the big side effects of this is it can cause the eye to shrink a little bit. Okay. So that can lead to some issues with that, but it's typically... Um, a less, lot less expensive than a lot of the other surgical procedures. Most of the animals will do well with that if that's what, the way we end up. And that usually works pretty well, too. Yeah, oh, yeah nice. it, it stops the, the fluid production pretty quickly. Huh. But you want to do it only in a blind eye. You don't want to do it if they've got vision because you want to do everything you can to pre- preserve yeah. their vision. Um, supportive care, um, some other things that we'll do, topical steroids if they've got an inflammation in the eye. And um, glaucoma is painful, so yes. analgesics, pain medication is going to be important as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to be monitoring these animals closely, uh, so we're going to be checking them every couple of weeks initially, every month, and then maybe um, three to four times a year after that. We mm-hmm. want to get that intraocular pressure less than 25 millimeters. If it's consistently above 30 despite all the topical treatments, that's when we're going to recommend the surgery, yeah. especially if they're still visual in that eye. Um, prevention. The genetic testing can be helpful. You just do routine screenings on the dogs that have the gene. Um, screening is good for catching the slow incremental increases, but typically when glaucoma comes, it comes on pretty quickly. So yeah. we're, we may not see it um, during the regular uh, annual exam or, or bi-yearly exam. So basically, any analysts that are going to present with any of those ocular symptoms, uh, conjunctivitis, mm-hmm. the corneal edema, any pain in the eye, we're going to check those pressures. Yes. So one of the ophthalmologists that I went to lecture, they said if you got a red eye, you're going to be checking the pressures because those animals could have glaucoma. Oh. So if uh, glaucoma is not that common, but it certainly does happen all enough that we're, we're going to be aware of it, we're mm-hmm. going to be looking for it. And because it can, you can have the pressures going up to, to quite high before they start showing symptoms. Mm-hmm. It's better to try to detect it and treat it before they lose their vision yeah. than if they've already lost their vision. So the first sign of any problems with your pet's eyes, bring them in. Yeah. Ask your vet to check the pressures just to be sure. And that's pretty much all I have on glaucoma. I think that covers pretty much a, a lot of the uh, problems that we see. So yeah. let's move on. And uh, case of the week, I wanted to do case of the week because I just saw Aslan this morning. Uh-huh. Aslan is a cat that actually had glaucoma. He yes. came in. The pressure in his right eye was 95 millimeters of mercury. Yeah, his okay. eye was bad. He had been in a month earlier for some dental procedures, mm-hmm. and he had some really bad stomatitis inflammation in his mouth. We've talked about that before. And he was doing okay, but he still had a lot of redness, so we put him on some steroids for that, and that helped to re- resolve that. But then she said he came in, he just wasn't acting himself. He just seemed, she wondered if he was having a side effect to the steroids. Um, when she brought made the appointment, his eye looked fine. By the time she brought him in, the eye was cloudy, mm. and it was very red around the eye. And then I noticed a little black spot on the cornea. I don't know if that was a foreign body or an inclusion. Could have been nothing to do with the glaucoma. Um, so I was worried that maybe he had gotten poked in the eye or yeah. something. She also mentioned that his his iris had been discolored and a little bit different, darker than the other eye. Mm. And so we thought, well, maybe he's got a tumor in there. Yeah, that's causing that fluid to build up. Uh, I was able to get a hold of an ophthalmologist on a Saturday, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. And she said, basically, um, at that pressure, there's no vision in the eye. Yeah. There's a good chance there's cancer in that eye. Let's get it out. Okay. So that's what we did. We did an, a, a nucleation on Aslan. Um, the next day, he was feeling so much, much better. better. Yeah. His attitude had changed 180 degrees. Instead of being kind of... Um, withdrawn and not letting us do stuff he's rubbing his face against us even where he had the stitches mm-hmm. he was just so happy to i think it was still causing him a lot of pain oh yeah definitely 
And so when we see animals that are, are acting like that, I think well, that's one of the things we should watch is pain as a symptom for looking for glaucoma. Yeah. So we took the stitches out today. The owner's very happy. The cat is back to his normal self. He's grooming himself. He's doing all sorts of things he didn't normally do. So really, really happy with that. All right. Tech tips. Yes. So this week, since we were talking about the jealousy mm-hmm. study, I thought it'd be kind of neat if you had any tips on when people bring a baby, baby. into the house and there's already dogs or cats mm-hmm. there. I was at a house call this morning and the lady had uh, three cats and a new new kid. <laughs> and it uh, took a while for the one cat to kind of train the kid. She said her baby learned to hiss from that cat. Oh, fun. <laughs> But uh, what should people be aware of? Because this is a a life-changing situation for the dogs. Yeah, so for dogs and even our very sensitive cats, um, this is a huge shock for them. Um, A lot of times what we do recommend for people is... You know, getting them first thing is getting them used to the noise, um, because with babies there is the noise of the crying and things like that. Right. Um, so one thing I've always recommended for owners is like maybe getting a baby doll or something, and then like play videos or recordings of babies crying or making the noise or things like that. Um, when you have you know, with babies, you bring in new items as well. Uh, the bassinet, cribs, baby toys, pacifiers. A lot of times new babies and their new things equal foreign bodies for us. Right. Um, because a lot of dogs and cats have never seen pacifiers or nipples or these things right. or type of toys. You could drop so something on the floor they think it's food. They think it's food. <laughs> um, or even the jelly seat thing where most dogs or cats will try to take it from the baby because they know mommy and dad gave it to them, so I'm going to take it too because I want it. Um, so a lot of times they'll end up taking it, and of course, what do they do? They chew it, they eat it, they break it into little pieces. Um, so getting them used to seeing these objects as well. So bringing them in before you even have the baby come in. Um, So a lot of times, because one of our um, assistants here had to go through it with her two cats, um, she had, you know, a room that was originally the kitty's room. Uh Then she had, you know, she found out she was pregnant. And so Kitty's room turned into the new nursery room. Yes. So as all the stuff came out of the room and they started cleaning it up, one of the cats became very, very stressed out. And he's easily stressed about anything. Um, but, you know, as the crib came in and all the baby changing stuff came in, you know, she would say that he would sit at the door and just angrily look in the door. Or he <laughs> started to get UTIs because he couldn't go in that room anymore. Angrily look at mm, Yeah, yeah, it, cat's funny. <laughs> Um, but one thing she did notice is that he would keep trying to jump into the baby crib. And so she was trying to figure out a way to keep him out of the crib. Um, and one thing, you know, I was told her, I was like, you know, let him get to the crib so he can actually see it. Because the more you try to block an animal from it, the more curious they are going to be about it. And then what's going to happen one day, you're going to come home, find a baby and a cat in the crib. Um, so I told her, I said, leave the door open. You know, he is going to go in that room eventually with or without a baby in there. Let him see what everything is about. Do it, of course, supervised. So we make sure there's no pee, no poop, nothing right. getting chewed or anything like that. Um, and that's exactly what she did. You know, she brought him in. She turned on some toys to see how the noise and everything would affect him. He immediately ran away. Um, so I was like, that's one way to keep him out of the room is turn on the kitty toys. Yeah. Or, yeah, the kid toys. Um, yeah, those little mobiles that make the music and mm-hmm. stuff. He would that. not like it or even like she had a diaper genie that when she stepped on it, it popped open and made like a little pop sound. He hated it. Um, so I told her, I was like, you need to desensitize him from these things. Um, so I told her, I was like, you know, when you're at home, keep opening these things, open the door, making these noise because it is going to help desensitize him from these yeah. things. And it did slowly but surely. He is on um, phylloxetine right now, which does help keep him calm it's like a doggy a kitty downer right um but between that and helping to desensitize him um you know her kid's now three years old and that's her best friend in the house right now the kitty cat um but he's doing great and it's this kind of the same thing with dogs too especially dogs you know they can get away with bigger things unlike a cat um a dog can walk away with a whole kid's toy or a diaper or something yeah, like diapers. that mm-hmm. oh, we see dogs eating diapers all the time or you know owners always buy bottles and the nipples go missing dogs eat that and the same thing with cats you have to think those are rubber mm-hmm. um and a lot of time especially depending on which situation they come from a lot of puppies or kittens can be bottle fed so they see that nipple and instinctively they're like i know uh-huh. what this is i want it back 
Um, but you know, that's a thing where you have to show them this isn't yours, this is for the baby, or if you see them trying to go for it, distract them with something else. Um, but a lot of times it is just that desensitizing. Um, sometimes we do recommend doing pheromones around that room, especially if you have a pet that is already easily stressed out, um, because it can just keep them from getting stressed, just like our assistant, her cat kept getting UTIs because he couldn't get into that room. Um, so if you have a cat that's easily stressed like that, that helps. Um, if you have dogs that are going to scratch at the door because they want to get in there, they do have protective coverings that help cover the bottom part of the door to keep mm -hmm. them from scratching at them. Right. Um, and then again, you just biggest thing is the slow introduction and desensitizing um, thing. You know, if you know your dog doesn't like loud noises, you have to get them used to, I would play a recording or on this uh, speaker or something of a baby crying or something because you don't want your dog and child waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning and then you have two issues to deal with. Um, but it's just something where slow and steady. Yeah. Um, and then always, especially for dogs and cats, making sure you know, you know how your pet's going to react too. If you have a cat who you know, f their first thing to do is to hiss and strike, you know, definitely make sure you don't have the kitty in the room with the baby right. um, until you slowly introduction or if you have a dog who will jump on everything you know make sure you slowly teach them especially with the pregnancy not to jump um, because the last thing you want is you know doggy to jump on mommy while she's holding baby or right. something um, but slow introduction easy training positive reinforcement and then again, medications if you need it or pheromones. Um, a lot of times they are a temporary thing sometimes. Um, sometimes they do go a little longer. One of our doctors here, her dog has been on phylloxetine since her first child and she's on baby number two now and it's mm -hmm. almost been five years. Um, and he does great on his medications, but he does not like kids at all. Um, but you know, he's happy in his house. He coexists with his two legged siblings now, but mm -hmm. you know, he's, they're not his best friends. <laughs> and, and there are animals that will adapt to a Definitely. new baby very yes. well. Uh, one of my wife's favorite pictures is that one of our cats curled up in the stroller with mm -hmm. the kid, and they're just sleeping head to head next to each other. So. Yeah. Um, a lot of animals will take on a kid. But if you're having a problem, check with your vet, check with your techs, get some tips on how to do this. Mm -hmm. And it they will adapt. They will do well. And like I said, this one cat has the baby trained. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just leave him alone. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. She said to see the, the baby hiss when she sees the cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to move on to a condition that's uh, more of a, a serious condition in cats. Yeah. It's the feline lower urinary tract syndrome, or the block cat. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to call it FUS, feline urinary syndrome. Um, and this is when they get crystals forming in their urine. So we're going to talk about the causes of that, um, how we treat it, how we prevent it. Mm -hmm. So that'll be an interesting uh, topic next time. So don't forget to follow us on um, your uh, podcast. Yeah so that you can get uh, episodes every week and subscribe on YouTube. If you're watching us on YouTube, if you're not watching us on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe and you'll get those. There's a button behind beneath uh, Brittany there and there's a little bell you're supposed to click on to get notifications. Okay. So if you're not doing that, you may not get the notifications, but you certainly can uh, see our video show in your feed. And that's all we have for this week. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. We'll see you next time.